This is the piece we're going to be making today. It's, uh, or actually, this is the piece you're going to see me machining. This is version number two, which we'll talk about a little later. It's a surprisingly complicated piece. I mean, I had to machine all six sides. There are tapped holes everywhere. There are uh, recessed pockets within pockets. The reason it's so complicated is because there's just a lot happening in the wrist here. It's a very small space, but you can see I needed to hold on to limit switches. There, um, there's another limit switch right up in here. It's got to mount the gearbox and the motor. I needed to be able to access the set screw to connect the motor to the gearbox. Some of these features are there to allow for easier disassembly. So first I wanna walk you through how I machine this piece from start to finish, but I also wanna to talk to you about why I decided to have a company named Jacob make this piece instead of me making it myself. I mean. Clearly I know how to make it. When does it make sense to outsource and when should you do it yourself? I think that's worth talking about. All right, let's get started. So let's zoom in here and get a really good look at this part before we start machining things. You can see I've made this component transparent to make it easier to see what's going on inside. Uh, these two tapped holes are for holding a limit switch on the other side. If I decided to move it, I wanted to have options. And these four are for holding on a cover plate, which I never got around to making and installing. One of the tricky parts was I wanted to be able to assemble and disassemble this thing without too much trouble, but I also wanted it to be one part. And that's how I ended up with this recessed pocket here, which allowed for room for the head of the screws. This big hole on the other side is actually serving two functions. It serves as a locating hole for this giant pin, but also this provides an access hole for me to be able to machine those features buried on the other side of the part. And this is something you want to think about all the time, not just how the part will function, but also how it will be manufactured. If we zoom in really tight, we see this area down here in the middle, and this opening has a very specific purpose. I needed to be able to tighten the set screws on this harmonic drive to the, connecting it to the shaft after this whole thing was assembled. And I wanted to be absolutely certain that this didn't slip at all. So I cut a keyway in the shaft, which allowed me to push the set screw all the way down into the keyway. And now it serves two purposes. The bottom of the keyway serves as a flat spot for the set screw. And also the side of the set screw can serve as sort of a small key. So that the relationship between these two always stay in sync. They will definitely move together. Unless of course I shear off the set screw, but I don't think the forces will be that high. Now I could have bought a gearbox that was actually designed to work with this sort of shaft. These come in many different configurations and this smooth shaft without a keyway was designed for one of the clamp style uh, connectors for the, the coupler. But I wanted to save money, frankly, and so I bought all of these parts used. I bought these uh, gearboxes in particular at industrial auctions or even on eBay sometimes. So I was able to save many thousands of dollars on these gearboxes, but in exchange, I needed to make you know some modifications. I made couplers in some places, I made uh, spacers, I modified the shaft in this case where I cut a keyway. So making these adjustments allowed me to save a lot of money in exchange for the time I invested in making those changes. The most difficult aspect of making this part is making sure that I have a really good relationship between this face, the center of rotation here, and uh, this rotation axis here. So these are all important relationships, but as you can see, they're on different faces and I'm taking this thing out of device at least five times, right? I've got to machine a lot of different faces. So I need to be really careful with how I set this part up. And since this face is the most important, I'm gonna start with that one first. So let's go throw a hunk of metal in the machine and start machining. So I'm gonna talk you through step-by-step step how I machine this part, but I wanna be careful here not to come off like some kind of expert. I am very much an amateur machinist. And in fact, three years ago, when I was machining this part that you're looking at now, I was even more of an amateur. The machine that you see here is my very first CNC machine. And this part is within the first 10 parts that I've ever made using a CNC machine. So this is all about just sharing my experience, not necessarily professional advice. <laughs> Anyway, after we probe the part, uh, we're machining the top face off here. And it might look like the part is sticking way out of the vise, but as you'll see in a minute, I'm gonna machine almost all the way down to the surface of the vise. So I just needed that much sticking out in order to uh, machine this part properly. 
at least what I thought was proper for the time. Another thing that I want to mention here is during the time when I was using this bridge port, I had to run the coolant fairly low. You'll see it looks like it's kind of just drizzling on the part. And that's because my splash guard just wasn't very good. And whenever I turned the coolant up to really blast the chips out, which would be the right way to do it, I was throwing chips and coolant everywhere. The floor was getting really slippery and it was frankly just dangerous. So I found it was better for me to let the coolant just drizzle on the part. You'll see that the speed is very slow here. This is actually sped up five times. So I'm cutting this part very slow, but this worked out okay for me. It kept me from making a mess and uh, the machine part came out okay in my opinion. And here you can see why I needed to have the part sticking out of the device so far. As you can see, there's only maybe an eighth of an inch left or about three millimeters. When I was thinking about the order of operations for machining this part, my main mindset was that the most important features are related to this face, this face and the center of this circle here. So I'm gonna try to cut as many features as I can without removing the part from the vise. And that's pretty much what I did. Back when I was making this part, I didn't know how to use a thread mill or how to do tapped holes in the machine. So I just manually tapped those holes after I got done with this part. And you'll also notice I used a short end mill before I went to the long end mill. And that was because I wanted to have less deflection when cutting that uh, first part of the edge. It just makes sure that I have a really good reference surface later when I flip the part over. Now I didn't record the probing of this side of the part, but basically I used that top front corner every time I rotated the part. And it's really important that you take a minute to think about what you're gonna use as your uh, reference surface at each stage of this operation, because you're gonna be machining away surfaces and you don't wanna reference something that you've cut away earlier in the process. So just be sure to think about uh, what surfaces you'll be able to use to actually uh, probe the part, figure out where you are, and start your next series of cutting operations. So at this stage, the part is face down in the vise, but all of the features on this side only need to be parallel with that face, and that's easy enough to check within the vise. As I mentioned earlier, these are the tapped holes that hold the limit switches as well as hold down the cover plate. Uh, none of these dimensions are critical. You could measure them with a tape measure. Here we're down to the last operation inside of the machine where I need to drill out this recessed pocket. So I'm probing the part and then my son walks into the shop. Let me tell you, when my kids walk in, this is like the highlight of my day. I love for them to be a part of what I'm doing out here. Basically, I'm just gonna spend the next several minutes trying to get him caught up on what I've been doing. And then at some point, I'm gonna ask him to participate because I always try to get them to do something while they're out there. All right, got it, man. I know you only saw the end of that, but like I said, it took me a whole day to get to this point. <laughs> and that was the scariest part. So I think we are done, finally. Yeah. I try it. 
Your chin. Now it's really fragile, so if you push it sideways, it will break. And if you break that off in there, I cannot get it out. So don't break it. All right, so here's what you wanna do. You just wanna gently twist like that and try not to lean one way or the other. It's a real easy twist. And when it feels like it's getting tight, just stop and I'll show you how to put it in reverse because you want to back up when it starts to get tight. Okay, stop there. So we'll flip this and now spin it. Um, you'll feel it clicks the other way now. Yep, you want to back it out about two turns or so. That's pretty good. And then you go back down again. And what that is, is there's a little metal chip building up inside of there and it makes it stick like that. Okay, so there are a lot of tabbed holes here. So we're just gonna speed on up to the end and let me show you what the part looks like. So here's a look at the original part. And as you can see, it's pretty rough in some areas. I didn't know much at the time about feeds and speeds and even less about a roughing pass and a finishing pass, but the dimensions came out right and the part was functional. I've only actually made a, a few small adjustments. The changes were quite minor, but very important for the things I want to do differently. Now that you've seen me make the part pretty much from start to finish, I want to talk about why I chose to pay someone to make version number two as opposed to me remaking it myself. There's actually quite a few reasons you might choose to do this, but I think it's worth discussing the pros and cons. The first obvious one is the cost, right? I had to pay someone to make this. If I made it myself, it's mostly the cost of material and the time it takes to make the part. But what I find most interesting about the time component is people can place a really wide range of values on their time. If you enjoy working on your car, you could pay someone else to work on it, but you might actually just want to work on it yourself, even if it would save you some time. So if we put aside the pleasure factor for a moment, especially in a business setting where you're not doing it for pleasure, you're doing it to make money, right? Then we're just left with the fact that there are only so many productive hours in the day, and how much is that time actually worth because if you're not working on this part you're going to be working on something else and what's the most value you can get for the time spent working on it so there's a very close relationship between how much you can make per unit of time and how much you're willing to spend to save time huh so in a weird sort of way uh this is sort of a, a nerdy analogy but as the amount of money you have approaches zero, the value of your time also approaches zero because you're willing to spend more and more time the less money you have available to get the things done that you wanna get done. So the value of your time is an important factor. But as I said earlier, if you're doing this for pleasure, then it's the flip, right? You would even spend money to have an opportunity to waste your time on the thing you enjoy. So both of those factors, both the pleasure you get in doing the activity and the value of your time can push this one way or the other quite easily. After that, we also have your own capabilities, right? If you don't have the capacity to manufacture the part or you can't make the quality that you need in terms of precision or surface finish or whatever, then obviously that would also be a reason why you might opt to let someone else do it because uh, you, you just don't have the capacity to get it done. It doesn't matter how much you enjoy working on your car, if you can't do the repair, you're gonna need to take it to someone who can do the repair. Another thing you need to consider is deadlines and schedules. So even though I have the capacity to get it done and could do it faster than I did it the first time, I still need to redo the cam. I still need to, uh, you know, cut pieces, get it in the machine, uh, carefully set everything up so that I get the precision that I want. And that would still require many hours of work that I just didn't have available in the week to invest in this part. And this is a situation I found myself in. I had other things that will produce more value for my time and I still needed to have this part made. And so it was worth it to pay someone else. And when I have that situation, I look to digital manufacturing to get it done. And that brings me to Jigga, which is the company I use to have these parts made and also the sponsor of today's video. What makes Jigga so powerful is you get access to a huge range of manufacturing capabilities all over the world, whether you wanna have it made in the US or wherever. And also the process is completely transparent. They don't try to hide who the manufacturer is. You can communicate directly with the people working on your parts. Having direct access with the manufacturer makes DFM so much more powerful. You can communicate directly with the people making your part. They can talk to you about subtle changes you can make which can make your part cheaper and faster to manufacture. And they can make hundreds or thousands of copies or just one. And so that to me is really powerful. So I'm gonna put a link in the description for you so that you can check it out for yourself. And if you're still skeptical, 
I suggest you just send them a sample part so that you can actually test out the service, see their capabilities, how quickly they respond. I think you're gonna be impressed. Not only will you be supporting this channel, you'll also get some fantastic parts made on demand. It doesn't get much better than that. So anyway, thank you so much for watching. If you wanna see more videos about this particular project here and see more of the manufacturing process, I'll put some links that you can click on right below this clip here. And hit the subscribe button if you wanna see more stuff like this. Thanks for watching.